Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends episode 109. So this week on the show lots to talk about including Spotify, Universal, uh, the latest research from uh, NPD on music consumption and much more. But uh, for now let's start with the introductions. So I'm really pleased to welcome on the show today uh, Nancy Baim uh, who is principal researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, so hi Nancy and how's it going today? Hi, things are going well. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. So you have a, a really you know, heavy background on, on, on academics. Uh, so how did you end up uh, at Microsoft? Um, well, Microsoft Research is a pretty academic organization. They're all about doing basic research. And I came and I spent some time here as a visitor and uh, awesome. was easily persuaded that this was the best place for me to pursue my academic agenda. That's great, cool. And yeah. uh, uh, we have uh, Eamon Ford as well on the show, uh, who's a freelance journalist uh, based in the UK and working for a variety of publications. So hi Eamon, and how's it going today? It's going very well, yes. It, I'm kind of uh, halfway through my day. You guys are just starting your day, but uh, oh. yeah, it, exactly. it, doesn't get, it doesn't get any better, that's what I can say. <laughs> I know. I think it's my earliest podcast recording. It's uh, 6 a.m. for me, so... Uh, <laughs> it's, <good. sympathies. laughs> it's not too bad it's not too bad all right so i think today uh i wanted to start uh, there, were, there were lots of news this week about it, and, and you know uh, feel free to interject with any any of your uh, viewpoints uh, because i know that you know nancy you have a uh, very interesting you know thoughts on on fa fandom and, and on all that side of things uh, on the academic side so feel free to interject at any point uh so you know, I wanted to start with Spotify just because there were so many news on Spotify this week uh, and starting with a rumored $100 million round, uh, which is going to be um, potentially announced in January. Uh, this apparently is going to be led again by Goldman Sachs, uh, plus a number of other investors, of course. Uh, so Spotify is kind of in a, in a really interesting position right now because uh, the, the company's uh, valuation is still really high. Uh, it's valued about $3.25 billion. You know, the company keeps adding subscribers. It's got about 15 million subscribers, uh, well, 15 million you, you, users. users. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the latest numbers were 15 million active users and 4 million paying subscribers. And um, and it's uh, launching in more countries. You know, it's, it's adding Ireland and Luxembourg. That was announced this week. Uh, so what I, w I wanted to, to, to ask you guys is... Uh, is um, uh, what do you think is uh, Spotify's curve at this point? I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, talk about um, profitability and rates and th the way that, uh, you know, um, and, and also another milestone that was announced is that they might actually end up turning around around $500 million worth of uh, of, of income uh, by January 2012, or 2013 for the year, which is which is a huge amount. It's, it's half a billion dollars, which is really a lot for one company working in the music space um, in, in streaming. Uh, so what I want, want to ask you, to you guys, you know, first of all, do, do you think uh, Spotify is on the path to profitability or is is the continuous funding, uh, you know, with these huge rounds just something that is patching a business model that is not quite working yet? Eamon? Right. Well, that, that's an interesting question because obviously Spotify has been burning through cash for four years, five years now. So... But what it's what it's trying to do in the market, and what other services, audio and Deezer <laughs> as well, are trying to do is is completely change uh, audience behaviour. So this this is going to take a long time uh, yeah. to do because they they can't they don't have to springboard off devices like Apple had. They're, they're they're creating a whole new sector in the market. So of course they're going to burn through money. They the blessing and curse is that the record companies have an equity stake in them yeah. so uh, all the majors do and the independents do so that that potentially gives them a stay of execution over and above other services that also allows them to offer the free side i think what will be the real challenge for spotify is to properly monetize its uh ad funded because that's basically the uh, the hook to get people in to subscribe, but it's also yeah. it burns through in royalty payments. So there was an interesting interview with Daniel Ek this week or last week, I think, where he basically explained why uh, Spotify offices in uh, America are in New York because it's to be close to Madison Avenue rather than to be close to all the tech people like yeah. in in Silicon Valley. So their, their play in the States is very clearly a commercial one. So they're building up that side of the business, but that's the bit that needs the most attention because when you get subscribers, that part of the business probably uh, cleans its own face, but the other part of the business, which is a big lag, and which yeah. they need to do to get consumers in, the bit that's, that's, that's just blasting through cash at the moment. But yeah. if, they, if they can properly build up 
uh, an advertising business and certainly trend if you look at the growth of Pandora and if you look at media span particularly in the US and radio it's diverting from traditional radio uh, onto online so they they're in a very good position to start to scoop up some of that money yeah. but they uh, the question is how long they the majors will allow this company to go and the investors particularly will allow this company to, to lose money yeah yeah, sure. Uh, Nancy, what's your take on, on this? Um, I mean, uh, Spotify has got a, the unique position that it can offer a free service as well. So that's really a, an interesting entry point for the f music fans to, to, to get into the service. It is. I think, I mean, I think it's a tricky balance for them, the, the free and the paid and, and balancing advertising. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge to figure out how, how that all works out in a way that, that people are satisfied with. I, I agree. It's, it's in a it's it's playing for the long game and in the short run it's really hard to know i think that it's a very disruptive influence in the music industry and it's part of a broader trend towards streaming as ever, all the things that we're talking about today speak to and the the growing prominence of streaming radio and streaming listening and mobile listening and listening where you are um so I think that it's going to take a while to play out, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the value systems rejiggered a bit as people try to figure out what's fair and what's, what people are going to be satisfied with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the two juggernauts, of course, are, are Spotify and Deezer, like, like we talked about a few weeks ago on the show. And, and, and there's a few players that are still sort of waiting in the wings to really make their, their huge splash into the market. Like, for example, Ardio, uh, because it doesn't have the free, free play, um, you know, of course, it, it, that limits its, uh, its user base, but it also limits its spend. So that means that it, it needs less money to burn and you can actually concentrate on generating uh, more meaningful revenue out of, out of that. Uh, well, it, interestingly, I was, I was at a talk uh, with Deezer a couple of weeks ago when they announced their funding and they claimed that the company is profitable. But I guess part of that is because they've got enormous bundled offering deals with uh, France Telecom, so with Orange yeah. in France and in the UK. And they're, they're going that way, so you've got a huge audience who you don't have to spend all that money on recruitment. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, it was interesting that they they claim to be profitable, considering how much focus is on the likes of Spotify burning through cash. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Nancy, uh, what do you reckon about? Because I know that in, in the US, four uh, G is much more advanced. That you know, in the UK, it's literally just launched. So there were a, a number of of articles in the UK press that they were talking about how 4G might be the next uh, stepping stone towards uh, getting more fans to convert uh, to paid su subscription services because of course faster access to music that might help uh, but in the US really we haven't seen almost any tie-ups between telecoms and uh, music services yet uh, do you think that's something that's that's in the works or, or, or do you think there might be fundamental blockers to, to that becoming a reality well I mean not to shill for my own company or anything, but Windows 8 is going to have the Windows 8 phone is going to be integrated with Xbox Music, and that's going to have streaming. So I think that that may be a harbinger of things to come of just having integrated services. I think, you know, certainly in say in Norway, for example, they've tied in the the streaming and the mobile phone industries so tightly that. Almost everybody is using streaming music services there. They're using WIMP, not not Spotify. Well, they use Spotify too, but WIMP especially. So, I think I think it's inevitable that the music delivery mechanisms are going to have to go wherever the people are and whatever the people are using. So, I think mobile. That said, 4G is spotty in the states. It's not like I mean, I live in a major metropolitan area, and it comes and goes depending what block I'm on. Yeah. So. It's not like we've got the halcyon days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and infrastructure it's, still infrastructure still has its limits. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, it kind of makes it a little bit easier for companies that have um, the ecosystem sussed out to work into this space. Because, for example, you know, Google has got the new Google Play uh, matching uh, thing that they've announced. Uh, Apple is post potentially has something in the works uh, in terms of uh, radio streaming. Microsoft has got has got the music uh, play uh, built into Windows 8, and that makes it a little bit harder for players like Spotify and uh, Audio and uh, uh, Rhapsody to get into that game unless they manage to make very strong tie-ups with the um, uh, um, you know uh, telecoms and and ISP providers. Uh, do you think that's that's the case, Eamon? 
Uh, it, it puts you in front of a, of a massive audience, but I think even some of those services have or are starting to run into problems because Cricket and Move was being held up, certainly by Universal, as this kind of groundbreaking model in the, in the States. But then there were some figures recently that that model was, was starting to, to hit the wall. I think going back to your point about 4G, I think that's going to have an impact on streaming from sites like Vivo and YouTube and Vimeo. I think the whole proposition of uh, the mobile application plays of all of the major streaming services is that you cache stuff on your handset so it doesn't affect your, your data charges. So yeah. uh, I think it will be kind of more rich media, so it will be video that will really take off with 4G, I think. Music because we've got these cash and solutions, and that's that's the selling point for a lot of people uh, to to upgrade and pay the ten pounds a month or ten yeah. euros or ten dollars a month uh, because they can store all the music on the handset. They don't have to go through uh, a music client like iTunes to get music on their phone anymore. They, they put everything on Wi-Fi. They cash it and they go about as they commute or yeah. whatever. So they don't, it doesn't doesn't affect them. But I think. Mobile will be the big thing, but I think outside of the major markets, I think it will be partnerships in China and India yeah. in the next five, ten years that will really see this massive, massive uptake. I think something like comes with music five years ago is an interesting model, but they didn't have the handsets. But the rise of really good and cheap, or reasonably cheap smartphone handsets, so all the HTC models and and the kind of increasing ubiquity of Android as well. This is this is pushing stuff in certainly in the developed markets, uh, in in music's favour. But I think when you take that proposition to China and India, when you've got like literally billions of potential customers, that's when you'll see a, a proper tipping point. The pricing will have to be dramatically lower though yeah. than uh, in uh, Europe and in the US. So yeah. potentially, I don't know, 15, 20% of what we're being charged to, to, to get uptake. Although I think in India and China, those are some of the only markets that comes with music actually still active in. So it yeah, shows so, yeah. mobile there. And certainly it's got a kind of uh, jump, uh, kind of leapfrog over a broadband. Most people will be, I think in India, they've got pretty, certainly in the major cities, they've got pretty good uh, mobile connections. So I think that's, if, if, if you're talking truly mass audiences, it, it's going to be in the developing nations and uh, South America, obviously, as well. Yeah. While Spotify has 4 million subscribers, that's that's like the tiniest sliver of the potential uh, music base you could imagine. So this is this is still an incredibly nice thing. We can get terribly excited yeah. about yeah. The, the steps that Spotify's making, but you compare that to the number of people who buy CDs or listen to radio, their only penetration is minuscule. Yeah, yeah. And, and Nancy, uh, I wanted to bring up a, a subject that uh, is quite hot in the States still, but, it, you know, it's, it's a worldwide subject, really, which is that of net neutrality. And I, I think it's, it's really important uh, to think about how the, the, the access is provided uh, to music and to content uh, um, on, a, on a connection level because uh, I think like bundling in services like for, for example with Microsoft or with Google or with Apple that is not a problem at all because people now with apps have access to all sorts of other services you know, it's, it's not like there's choices restricted in that sense but what worries me is the idea that uh, for example like it happened in Germany with Deutsche Telekom that um, if you subscribe to a particular service then that bandwidth doesn't go towards your your um, bandwidth costs so that really limits the potential for other services to come in into that particular telecoms market because of course people if, 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 they, if they see okay so if i stream two gigabytes of of, of spotify or of deezer or whatever that doesn't count toward my towards my bandwidth uh, so of course i'm going to go with them do you think that's an issue do you, th do you, you know do you think that everybody should be playing on a, on a sort of level playing field on that front I would like to see everybody playing on a level playing field. I think as a matter of principle, that's that's a better way to go. I think that m most people in the world don't really want to sit there and figure out which music delivery system is the right one for them. They just want to press a music button and have it work, you know, yeah. and it's it's geeks like us who really think that having 500 apps to choose from is a good thing <laughs> rather than an incredible burden. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in a way it's providing a service to give people one thing that's just there that they can use and it's built in. And on the other hand, of course, in, in as much as that restricts 
access to other music and other kinds of listening experiences, that's that's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to move on to t- talking about um, a story um, uh, that involved H- HP and Universal, and also Windows 8 in in, in a sense, because uh, basically what happened is that a Pocket Lint reported that um, HP and Universal has made a, have made a partnership uh, w- um, called Music Connected, wh- where whereby you know. Uh, uh, people are going to be able to stream all of Universal's catalog for a period of 90 days uh, on the purchase of uh, certain uh, Windows 8 uh, HP computers, uh, which is really interesting. I, I mean, for me, it's not the deal itself that is interesting. It's just the fact that it still shows that there's a huge value placed on music and there's a lot of companies that are trying to figure out how they can integrate music within their product offering to increase engagement of, of, of the people that are buying their products. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about this deal is that uh, there's the music that's it's involved, but there's also a, a VIP side of it uh, that actually ends up offering real experiences to people that enter competition. So you can win tickets to meet uh, you know Taylor Swift or uh, go to a gig or whatever you know it's it's kind of a it, it mixes real life experiences with with a music service uh, so do, do you think that's a trend that's going to continue I mean w- we've seen a lot of these partnerships in the past uh, that trend had kind of gone away a little bit but now there's there's a potential for for big catalogs like universals to play a part into offering something that that, that is interesting for corporations to to implement uh, you asking me yeah uh, I think that um, I think there's two trends there that are both on the upswing. One is people playing with new kinds of alliances. So people who didn't use ne- used to necessarily team up together, teaming up to figure out if they can if this will be the magic combination that 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 is successful. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's that's on the upswing, and it may be universal on HP and Microsoft one week, and next week it may be some other set of players that you didn't used to see working together that way. Absolutely. And which ones are going to work out in the long run? Like everything right now, I think, is, is, very, much, is very much in flux. The other point in that, in that is, is about participation, so the being able to win things and whatnot. And I think uh, Certainly, my work has shown, and, and and an awful lot of other work, and a lot of experience out there has shown that audiences are more and more participatory. You know, there's a, a huge sector that wants to just listen or just watch, but but the sector that wants to participate and be engaged and be doing things is is big and growing and is its own phenomenon on a yeah. on a huge scale. So, so trying to figure out ways to engage that is going to be critical i think for music services yeah no because the aim on f- of right now like a- any streaming service and any sort of real life experience is very much separated so you know the live yeah. live industry and all the recorded side which includes all the streaming services they don't really have any points of contact so it's it's uh, although it's a limited experience because of course it's just a universal catalog and it's for a limited amount of time uh, yeah. you know it's it's interesting to see people trying to bring those two things together and see if there's is a connection there. I, 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 think, I think it's interesting, but uh, maybe I'm being massively cynical here, but it reminds me of the dark, dark days of MusicNet and press play when you had these rival services that wouldn't cross-license. You had these partial offerings that yeah. were trying to net uh, a mass audience who don't care. Generally, most people don't mm-hmm. care what record company or don't even know what record company people are signed to. And it, be- it becomes irrelevant at the point of consumption. Yeah. So while it's, this is good for Universal to be out there doing deals and getting its orders in front of people, I think there is a negative side for the industry as a whole because I think the industry should be collectively moving towards all of these things. I think it, certainly in the last 10 years, the, the industry's the, the recorder industry has taken a bit of a beating. Yeah. So I think there should be, uh, at this point of crisis, there should be kind of a more sense of unity and they should be working collectively on all of these services. And yes, uh, some labels have reasons for not licensing to Spotify or not licensing to iTunes and that becomes a personal thing. But if you've got the four biggest, well now three biggest record companies in the world and certain ones are being locked out, uh, I think it's it's the consumer that ends up suffering because they're only getting a partial service. You can see that with something like Vivo as well because... Yeah. Uh, Warner Music still hasn't licensed to Fever, so there you, you've lost what 15% of the market straight away. And I don't know if that's because Fever's a joint venture between Sony and Universal, and, and Warner 
were excluded from those talks or if they had some reason to fall out with, with the labels over that service. But I think the consumer will start looking for, I don't know, Madonna catalogue or Green Day or Neil Young, and that stuff's not going to be there. So that I think that's going to damage the service because they'll see it as partial. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, uh, I wanted to uh, move on to talking about... Uh, uh, the idea of uh, well, it's something that is, is sort of a running theme for the for the past few years. The idea of scarcity, and uh, there was a, an interesting article by uh, Mark Mulligan on Music Industry Blog uh, talking about uh, pledge music uh, and uh, the the way that um, uh, Janet Devlin, who was an X X Factor contestant, kind of uh, managed to relaunch her her career a bit, like by by offering different types of bundles. Uh, this is not a new idea, but the idea that we are uh, recreating. Uh, scarcity from uh, a place where there's no scarcity in, in, the, in the consumption of music is, is interesting. Of course, we all know about the Amanda Palmer case uh, with Kickstarter and, and how much she managed to raise uh, with that campaign. And there's a number of artists that are trying to offer something that is is unique and makes people feel special about the purchase that they do and makes them feel connected uh, with the artist. Uh, uh, you know, Rihanna is just re- uh, is releasing a 150 pounds plus uh, box set uh, of her album with all sorts of special things inside that, that people can, can latch on to. Uh, so Nancy, of, of course, this is a, like a, a big area of expertise for you in terms of like the way people connect to artists and, and, and the way the fans behave. Uh, do, do you think that's, uh, that's a trend that's uh, bound to continue? And how can uh, an artist that is is bigger, you know, if somebody like, you know, say U2 or Dutch Chili Peppers, uh, take advantage of, of the same system uh, with it being so time consuming in, in terms of, you know, the, the way that you can, you have to dedicate a lot of time in creating all these special bundles and, 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 and delivering them. I, I think there, there are experts out there who can help you do that. I don't think you have to do it all yourself. Yeah. Um, for one thing, um, you know, I meant like a, in terms of a, a lot of these bands are offering, you know, Skype chats and hangouts and actual personal engagement. Yeah, that, that, kind of, that kind of stuff that can be very, very consuming. I yeah. think you have to it, you have to find the right balance for the right artists, you know, and not all artists think that it's going to be to their um, to their audience's benefit to spend half an hour Skyping with them. Yeah. They might think, you know, that's going to demystify the music a bit and it's not going to mean as much to them after they've hung out on Skype for half an hour. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's a question of finding the right balance and the right ways to let audiences participate for the right for the right artists. I think I was I was talking to somebody from Kickstarter last week, and we were talking about the problem with something like Kickstarter, where people end up with these huge collections of T-shirts and posters and baseball hats and all yeah. these objects that these scarce objects that they've gotten for participating, and they don't actually want the stuff, you yeah. know. And she was saying that she prefers that people offer, uh, you know, lossless downloads uh, or uh, images that you can download in high resolution and that, that one keeps to, to ephemeral deliverables. So I think engagement, that kind of one-on-one engagement for the right artists, yeah. it's, it's, it's great, but it's not for everybody. And I don't think it's always a good idea to think that um, your own time spent one-on-one with somebody is the best scarcity you can deliver and and that said backstage passes might be a very different situation with those same artists right sure i'm totally comfortable with that but half an hour skyping yeah and from your from from your experience you know do you think fans have changed the way that they they want their relationship with the artist to be over you know the course of the last 10 years with the the rise of digital media that, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I think that fans have gone from being beyond thrilled if they got a response to sort of feeling snubbed if they don't get a response. Yeah. Um, and then the boundaries around how, how long does that response go on are getting very blurry. Um, so some, I think there's a, a lot more people now who sort of expect to be able to have an ongoing interaction. And um, at the same time, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of artists who are thrilled to have that. You know, they're they're delighted that they can have ongoing interactions with their audience members and build relationships and have friendships. And for them, that's a way more important conversation than the one we were having earlier around Spotify and and streaming revenues and all of that because they're much more interested yeah. in this relationship building. And they figure the money will come from that. You know, we don't have to we don't have to focus on money. We can focus on this relationship building. And isn't it great? So. 
yeah it it depends yeah and uh, Amon, how do you see like uh, kickstarter you know that they're launching uh, i don't i don't know if they've launched yet in the uk over they, there about. Yeah, they've all either just open or just about to open yeah it's in about the to open yeah how, how yeah. do you see that the market expanding for for us in the uk as well I think it, uh, you will see more acts like this. I think it's interesting that most of the acts do not have some kind of profile, be it Amanda Palmer, who obviously through Roadrunner had a, had a certain level of, of, of fame through that. Janet Devlin, obviously, being one of the finalists of uh, The X Factor, and but bands who've been dropped and things like that. So I've, I've interviewed various artists about why they do this, and they, and they find it enormously time-consuming because, yeah. of course, you've, you've got to come up with ideas, so we get to Skype chat, or you take them out for dinner, or you go and play golf with them, or you play a living room gig, or all of these things. And maybe I'm... Maybe I'm too old to be excited about this, but I would rather my favourite artists just spend time being brilliant and yeah. writing brilliant songs and playing brilliant gigs rather than filling out admin forms and, and ticking off lists and things like that. Yeah, it's a thrill for for fans, but if that's going to lead to a decline in quality, because they, they give up full-time jobs and having to kind of live hand-to-mouth so that they could spend time on their art, yeah. and, and rather they spend time on their art. And they obviously they have a manager, traditionally, who dealt with all the, the business side of things. And I think that that boundary is now being blurred, where artists are expected to be their own business affairs manager managers and things like that yeah yeah well that's good and that's part of the diy revolution and it's fantastic because you can go through uh kind of cut through the the previous gatekeepers in in most cases the the major labels or or the big independents yeah. i think that comes at a cost as well so i think them spending their time doing these things is interesting but uh, if they're writing terrible albums as a result of not having much time to write better albums, I think we should pull the pull the brakes on things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and there's, there's an idea of ownership as well that that has shifted um, over the last few years, especially if these platforms keep uh, thriving the way they are, in in the way that the fans feel an ownership towards the end product or towards the the output of the artist uh, as opposed to before when they were just you know purchasing uh, uh, the music or listening to the music and then buying a ticket to a gig and that was still like a fairly disconnected experience uh, for them you know they didn't feel like the 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 artist owed them a great deal was now th there's a shift where the the audience really feels like the artists owes them their you know livelihood if you know the the main way that they founded their the recording or their tour is via one of these sites so that there's a lot more accountability that comes into into that yeah because the, the fan kind of becomes an investor and they feel yeah. that they they contribute rather than buying an album after the fact i.e after all the investments gone in they're they're, they're helping do it before and and certain nights really enjoy doing that merillion or an obvious example of, of been doing that for what nearly 15 years they they really kind of pioneered all yeah. of that they, and this is in the kind of pre-broadband era as well so i think that's that's quite revolutionary but i think there i think there still should be a bit of a kind of artist fan divide yeah in a way because i'm i'm reminded of a, a, a interview with neil tennant from the patch up boys and he was talking about there was this kind of sense of uh artists putting out like, demos on Facebook or, or uh, linking to them on uh, Twitter and saying to the fans, which which do you think should be the, the next single? And he said that my job is not to go around asking fans what they think the next single should be or what the, the next sign for the album should be. That's my job as an artist. I should be doing that. Yeah. So I think that if you've got enough faith in your own art, then you don't necessarily need to do that. But I, I, I understand why there's, there's a whole kind of middle class of artists who can't they don't have the luxury of years of hits where they're Mick Jagger or Paul McCartney and they don't need to do it for the money. There's a lot of people there who have to, have to keep this machine going simply to pay the rent or put food on the tables or whatever. They're not they're not living Austin Pitch's lifestyles and this this becomes part of the deal where I don't know, it's it's not it's not quite panhandling, but I feel there's something there can be something a bit kind of sad and a bit grubby about it at times as well. Yeah. If they're doing something innovative and fun that kind of chimes with their art and there's a there's a there's creativity put into these extra offerings, then I think that's that's a good thing. But if it's just taking off a, a checklist of you get the great backstage or things like that, it reminds me there's it's uh, Robbie Krieger and uh, Ray Manzarek from the from the Doors. They have this 
bit when they when they play. Obviously, they can't play under the name The Doors, but when they play, they have a kind of VIP ticket, and I think you pay like an extra two hundred dollars to meet them for five minutes backstage. That seems quite crass, really. Yeah. So <laughs> go to that extreme. I don't feel or like prostituting themselves in a way. Nancy, what do you what do you th- what do you feel about like the ownership factor of the fans towards the artists changing o- over? I think that when fans fund, they feel more invested. I don't think they think they own it, I, and I don't think that they feel that their funding entitles them to a say in the creative process. Yeah. I, I think that almost every artist will tell you that it's their job to write the songs, not the audience's. Some will tell you, I, asked, I gave them all 14 tracks, I asked which they thought were the strongest, and they agreed with me. Yeah. Um, so they sometimes will feel like, hey, I want them to enjoy it. So, you know, I'll let them sequence it or pick the 10 best or whatever. But but I think every artist will tell you that that they want to be the ones writing their music. And I think that 99.9% of fans will tell you they don't want to crowdsource the writing of the music. You know, we understand fans understand that the artists are the ones who write the songs and that's why we like it. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that that's a, I think the trade-offs are, there are absolutely trade-offs, but I think they're much, much subtler and that there are a huge variety of, of ways that people can be given opportunities to participate that feel more or less like prostituting yourself to different kinds of people and what to one person is like prostituting yourself to another might feel like great engagement and you mentioned Marillion and Marillion pulled back from fan funding for just that reason and they said it it feels cheeky to keep going back asking for money when we've got the money and the fans were ticked off they wanted they wanted that accountability and it wasn't that they wanted to direct the creative process it was that they wanted to know what was going on during the recording and to know how it was proceeding. So there's a lot of ways to provide windows into the creative process. I think the whole issue around how much time does the artist have to spend actually doing this is an enormous issue. The roles are shifting dramatically and and I think musicians are in fact like almost everybody else in contemporary Western economies where more and more of the workload gets shifted down onto us, you know, and we're doing more, more than to do regardless of what our job is um, and I think this this is absolutely true of, of musicians and I think that we know very little in fact about in fact how do these things actually lead to revenue do they lead to revenue what are the mechanisms through which doing something like letting 50 people hang out with you leads to any kind of sustained economic anything yeah. financial there's a lot of faith involved here that it reaching out and participating somehow or putting stuff on mobile phones or putting things on Spotify or taking things off Spotify or there's a lot of blind faith or or good guesses or or reasoned decisions but there's very little real evidence of how any of these things play out in the long run for yeah. who and where the money really is in these matters yeah and and I, I, I necessarily have to do the stuff if they're really uncomfortable with it I'm not convinced it's the those are that's the only way to engage audiences and do that kind of have yeah. that kind of relationship. Absolutely, and and we can we can look at, at the other side of the coin. So there was a, an article on Music Ally uh, by Stuart Dredge. Uh, you can find all the article links in the show notes as well uh, for the audience that is, that is listening. Uh, that um, reported the latest numbers for 2011 uh, in terms of uh, marketing investment by record labels and uh, A and R investment as well. So the marketing uh, investment has been 4.5 billion for 2011 uh, uh, by record companies, uh, of which uh, 2.7 billion was spent in A and R. So this is really an interesting. Uh, uh, you know, a window on on putting in perspective the fund funded side with the the you know the big muscle record label side because there's still a huge divide. I, I I would be interested to see like some numbers put together as to what is the value of all the fund funded uh, you know campaigns that have happened in the past in, in year and compare that to these kind of numbers and and I, I think you know that would be a yeah kickstarter in the last two years has funded i, I believe 8900 music projects for 55 million dollars so it's okay 
So we can see, yeah. you know, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of, of the A&R spend that the record labels are doing. And, and I think the record labels know that because uh, uh, in, in face of, I think it was something like 16, 17% drop uh, uh, since 2008, that the actual uh, drop in the investment in A&R has only been like of, of, of like three or four percentage points or something like that. Uh, I, I, th I think there, there's an interesting point in that, though, that which has to be measured out, which is that while label revenues have gone down and investments kind of stayed relatively stable over the last three or four years, labels are investing in more sets of rights as they push through 360 deals. Okay. So you would hope that that level of investment is going up because they're going to get a cut of publishing or merchandise or live or endorsements and all of those things that traditionally they didn't get uh, involved in. And that also affects the types of artists that they're signing as well because I know that Warner's has a very very firm policy of oh, i don't know maybe that, that's been relaxed under its new russian owners but certainly when it was under edgar bronfman they had a 360 uh deal or nothing and universal i think pretty much every act it signed in the last couple of years has been multiple rights deals so it's been 270 and up and i think most of them are 360 deals. so yeah you would hope that the level of investment would go up because the revenue streams are uh or greater, although when I put that question to Max Hall of uh, Universal International on Monday at the at the IPI press conference, he claimed that the money coming in from 360 days from non-recorded was minuscule. But yeah. then they, but I think this is going to be a long way so that in five years they will see a dramatic difference. But but if you've got uh, a 360 day with hypothetically Robbie Williams and Robbie Williams goes on tour. You're yeah. going to you're very quickly going to make more money from his live shows than you will from Spotify streams, iTunes downloads, CD sales. And I think that was certainly the case with uh, his first 360 day with EMI back in 2002. I kind yeah. of heard people at EMI suggesting that within a couple of shows they they'd got their investment back very very quickly. That that tour worked out very very well for everybody involved so it, it depends how active the artist is if you've got a 360 deal and the artist is just putting out records during that particular period then your returns not going to be great but if they're out and they're actually touring and selling merchandise and all of those things then that investment level that that they've kind of held held steady will start to make proper sense because you're suddenly all these huge revenue streams that previously you were locked out of have suddenly been opened up to you and you get a share of that yeah, and 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 Nancy, the the role of ANR has kind of has changed a lot as well in the last ten fifteen years, uh, just because of the way that bands end up being signed now. So, uh, although the investments is, is stay the same, there are certain elements that are compulsory for a band to be able to get under the radar of of an ANR person, uh, and and the fan base is a key part of of that radar. So, if there is no fan base, if there's no buzz to the band, it's almost impossible for a band to get any traction. You know, a, a band has to be pretty much sure nowadays in their in their in their process and in, in the way that they've developed the music to actually attract the interest of, of a record label do, do you think that's changed the way that the bands also structure their, their careers at the beginning because you know they know that they have to have at least a couple of eps or even a full-length album before they can even hope for them for the most part to get get a, a deal with the, with, the, with the label I guess I, I I would question how many bands are actually starting with the premise of getting signed by a label and, and being the next Robbie Williams with a 360 deal. I yeah. think that um, now, as always, it's a, it's a small subset of people who want to play music who are really, you know, aiming for stardom. I, I think it's true that, that a, a lot of bands who would like to do it professionally would like to get a label, um, but I think that that you know, I mean, I can't I can't really speak to to how most bands are planning. My sense is that most bands aren't really planning. They're trying to pay rent and things yeah. like that, and trying to make decent music, and they're trying to figure out what the best strategy is in a time when it's very difficult to know what the best strategy is. And anybody who tells you that what you have to do is this, this, and this is making it up, you yeah. know, so they're trying a bit of everything, and I think that, that young bands feel, uh, you know, crushed under the burden of, of having to manage their own careers and having to figure everything out from the start, but yeah. that said, I think that, you know, if I think back 30 years ago, 
and the bands that you knew then, you know, hardly any of them even ever figured they'd have any shot at a at yeah. more than a local audience. So absolutely, brain has shifted, and 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 now everybody's got a shot at it. But you have to work a lot harder to even be a local band now. Yeah, exactly. I can give you some numbers actually. Though in the same article talks about the fact that the IFBI um, hailed the results of a survey whereby 301 unsigned bands in the UK, uh, of 301 unsigned bands in the UK, 71% uh, said that they aim to be signed by a record company. I mean, that's an interesting figure, but you also have to take into account that it's, you know, these numbers were hailed by the uh, FBI, so I'm not sure what the context of the survey was. Of course, that plays into their interest <laughs> of wanting... Measure unsigned bands. Who was that? Where did they go to get a list yeah, of unsigned uh, bands yeah. to randomly sample? Yeah, exactly. So that's, yeah, uh, the, well, they're, they're not going to publish figures where it said only 1% of bands that we spoke to want a deal. They're not yeah. going to, those kind of figures aren't going to be published, of course. Uh, well, it also depends on what what way the question was was phrased as well. Yeah. But I think, I think the fundamental point is that labels, even within the, the music industry ecosystem, it's still labels are the primary investors in new music. Yes, yeah, yeah, they buy that drum repeatedly, but I think they've got much justification to do that. Even the, sometimes you might get a development deal from a publisher or something like that. But I worked on a report a couple of years ago with Tony Wadsworth of Acts of EMI, and the figure that we find when we were speaking to lawyers and managers and stuff like that, that there's a cutoff point of investment for them of fifty thousand pounds in an artist, then they would start to look to somebody else. So it's if you want serious investment in your career, it, it, you you are going to go to a record label, and that can be an independent because yeah. obviously big independents like Ministry of Sound or Beggars Group or uh, Domino have got the budgets to do that, and that's why they develop. Big acts, but yeah, I think you can get you can get to a certain point with minimal investment, and certainly the tools out there to do things um, and build up a buzz are, are uh, quite cheap, and in many cases free for bands. So they can get to a certain level with minimal investment, yeah, yeah. Uh, in a way that previously didn't. But obviously, I guess the biggest cost and the bit that still hasn't gone down is uh, is the live side of things. So that bit of traveling overnight in the back of a van to play to two people in a, a bar when you're third on the bill and you have to go through that grind for a year and a half they uh, the cost of petrols going up all of these things all while lots of tools are making it easier for bands and cheaper for bands the the main bit where that you kind of build a buzz and build a following is costing incrementally more for artists yeah Sure, and 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 in in the same survey, it was talking about how now to break an act, it costs uh, about one point four million dollars. Uh, that was in twenty eleven, so that was an average to break an artist in a major market. Uh, so that gives you like a little bit. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a you know pie in the sky figure a little bit, just because I'm sure the costs vary wildly from artist to artist and from how the campaign goes and what kind of awards they get or anything like that. I'm sure like. I'm sure Alt J that just won the Mercury's they haven't probably spent 1.4 million dollars <laughs> to get four dollars. Yeah, to, to get where they are. Uh, so that varies wildly from artist to artist. But it's interesting to see that figure just because you compare that to the one million dollar that Amanda Palmer managed to raise, and she's the only one that's managed to do that so far on on a crowdfunded level. And you see how hard it is to match that type of investment uh, from from a a, a fan funded. Uh, environment uh, and and bring that to the, to the to the to the mainstream because I think she managed to get a top ten album on the Billboard or something like that uh, and that's an achievement of course uh, but she's got a huge background uh, also with major labels and she's got a huge fan base but for anybody else to try and do the same thing on a without the support of a label that would be uh, pretty much almost impossible I mean uh, from 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 that IPI figure, one one of the most interesting sub points about that one point four million was how much money's being spent on promo videos. That was kind of between a third and half a million, which no in this kidding. day, age, which in this day and age to spend that sort of money on a pro, it's just ridiculous. It's yeah, like the, the it's absurd. like the, sorry, the budget was absurd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why, why do you need that? People are people. It's not like you're getting a big showcase on MTV or on TV anymore. Videos are being watched on YouTube. They're being watched on mobile phones. You don't need to spend that sort of money on a video. I think. So I, I think it's ridiculous that that the the budget is skewed 
so strongly towards things like that. Yeah. And and so strongly towards so few. I mean, when we're talking, how many people are going to be stars at any given moment? And how many people are making music in the world and trying to make a living at making music? I just think it's, to some extent, it's, I recognize the economics of scale, but to some extent, it's absurd to be talking about the 30 people at the top of the pie as though that's the music industry when we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people making music professionally and making livings, making music and finding ways of doing it. And to my mind, that's where, that's what we need to be focused on understanding, you know, that's where the future is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, well, I think uh, I'm going to go towards the wrap here. Uh, it was great having you on. So first of all, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, is there anything you would like to plug or anything that you've been working on that you, you'd like to mention? Uh, Eamon? Oh, goodness me, I'm very terrible at self-promotion. What am I doing? I'm writing a, I'm writing a feature uh, for the issue of Q at the end of the year on musicals. It's a whole oh. big industry that people don't talk about, but uh, yeah. in the UK last year, the West End, I think it was worth... The, the West End uh, sector was worth 500 million, something like that, in revenues, but musicals were generating about 370 million of that. So it's this quiet part of the industry that people don't care about. So it's like things like We Will Rock You and Mamma Mia. These, these were phenomenally successful things. I've spoken to head of business affairs at Universal, Adam Spiegel, who was a producer, yeah. did like uh, Hairspray and Grease and things like that. Nice. And Bill McIntyre, who uh, kind of nearly lost his entire livelihood back in We Will Rock You because it was an absolute disaster when it when <laughs> and they had to change it uh, during the first six months. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm writing about musical theatre, which is a thing that I've learned an incredible amount about in the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay, that's awesome. And uh, are, are you going to see any shows just to get us some, uh, some perspective? I, uh, yes, I am. I am going out tonight to see Lady Huck, who has produced one of my three favourite albums of the year, and the other two being Django Django and Sharon Van Etten. So I'm very excited to see Lady Huck tonight. Awesome. Very nice. And Nancy, anything your end? Uh, I, have, I, have, I have a couple of pretty readable pieces coming out pretty soon. One is yep. going to be in an online uh, journal called Participations, and it's about um, the way that the lines between being a fan and being a friend get blurred and how musicians deal with that blurriness. Um, and then I've got a piece coming out about um, how, how musicians make sense of Twitter and yeah. dealing with Twitter. So I got those two things in the pipeline. That's great. Well, uh, thanks very much. I'm going to put the links, of course, and, and your Twitter accounts in the, in the show notes and in the end titles. And it was absolutely great having you on. Thank you so much. Pleasure, thank you. Okay.